Uh, today we have Neil Coleman, who is going to talk about citizen science and participative research, whether it's a pathway to open research. Neil is the library citizen science engagement officer, and he's currently in the process of setting up library services geared towards supporting participatory research at the University of Edinburgh. And you are more than, more than welcome to feel to drop him an email or if you have any thoughts or questions or just if you want to talk about citizen science and participatory research with him. So maybe I hand over to Dean. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for coming everyone. Um, one of the things I've already said, I'm very keen for this to be very conversational. Everyone to have a lovely chat at the end to talk about participatory research. I'm aware that some of you are probably very immersed in this kind of research process and some of you perhaps are more distanced from it. So my role is a new one. I'm based in the library. Um, the title is expansive, Library Citizen Science and Participatory Research Engagement Officer. Basically, I'm here to set up new services and look at the services we already have in the library, help facilitate research of this kind across the university. So what I'm going to do in this talk, I'm going to start off primarily for those of you who perhaps have more distance from participatory research, to uh, just overviewing what it actually is, because it's an expansive category. It's not just one methodology. It's um, not even necessarily a method, according to some people. Um, and then I'll just outline what we're doing at the library, some of the avenues we're thinking of taking. Then I just want to present some questions to you and hopefully we can have a lovely little conversation trying to answer those questions. We won't answer those questions now um, and you can maybe talk about what you would like from these services, what the needs you have as a researcher, but also just generally chat about participatory research and the challenges you face, the benefits you've had um, and, you know, have a little think. So starting off, if the slides work. There we go. I'm oh, sorry, I just started off with a pretentious quote because I just love this quote because it is really lovely. Um, so the idea is that participatory research is a renaissance. It's this wonderful opportunity where we really bridge the gap between research and researchers and everyone else. It's an opportunity to really bring them in as a form of power sharing. It's a form of control sharing and it's a very active form of open research. A lot of open research are things like open access and these are essential and hugely important, but they have limitations. Um, they don't bring people in, they open the door. Participatory research is great because it takes the next step. It allows you to actually welcome them in, get them inside to research and immerse them in research and get them really involved, which I think is absolutely fantastic. I'm not going to read out the quotation. You're welcome to take a screen grab and have a little look later, but I think it's just lovely. So at its core, as I said, participatory research, as we are using the term, is a form of power sharing. It's a form of control sharing. It's where you give control as a researcher over to an external collaborator who is not a researcher. Um, this looks different depending on what you're talking about. So if you're looking at kind of participatory methods often in the social sciences, in the first instance, um, the idea is that this gives them control and direct and it tends to be quite a high level of collaboration. Citizen science, in contrast, as it's often traditionally understood, tends to be lower level collaboration. Um, and it's, but in general, it means scientific work undertaken by members of the general public, often in collaboration with or under the direction of professional sciences and in scientific institutions. There's various ways you can think about participatory um, within citizen science. In a moment, I'll expand this model and show you that there is, we tend to think of it in a certain way and perhaps we should shift our thinking. So participatory in citizen science, um, you can think of it as a very low level participation, a low level of control sharing, a low level of power sharing. So citizens as sensors, you take your phone, you go to the beach, you take a photo of a shell, and then you send that photo to the Natural History Museum. And thousands of people across the country are doing it. And then the Natural History Museum interprets that data. They do all the magic with the data, they analyze it, and then they come up with um, research outputs by themselves. So there's very low level interaction. Um, as you work up, citizens might have interpreters. They might work to look at that data and think about that data alongside the researchers. So there we've got kind of an interpretational level. 
the next level up. We've got participation in uh, definition and collection, uh, data collection processes. That's lovely because then we start to have people going, hey, I've got a really interesting question, which I hope you can help with. There's a lot of traffic noise in my neighbourhood. I need to get some evidence and do a report so I can send it to the council and ha perhaps have this problem solved. Um, you're helping to, the public is helping to design the research process. They're helping to identify questions. And then I love this term, um, it comes from UCL, extreme citizen science. So at this point you have um, people not only defining the questions, but they basically run it. Researcher becomes a facilitator and they directly facilitate the research. Um, they're equal partners or even lesser partners with the communities they're working with. So that's one model you can think about for participatory research. The one issue I have with this model is that it presents it in a very dichotomous format. It suggests you're either doing participatory research or citizen science, or you're not doing it. In reality, it's a lot more nuanced. A lot of research projects will involve participatory elements and they'll face the same challenges as one that identifies as a fully participatory research project. So I like this model a bit more partly because it's prettier, but partly because it really represents the fact that in your research process, there's lots of ways in which you can have participation. So citizen science, as I was just discussing it in that kind of traditional sense of the term, although it can be used in many different ways, you typically look at the collect part of the research cycle. So you have participants involved, so kind of in the middle level of the circle, going out and collecting the data. But at every other level, they might be informed or consulted, but for the most part, it's very low level. Research projects can have participation at any stage of this project, uh, uh, this process. It can be at the dissemination stage only. Perhaps you want to make sure that the people who need to hear these results are going to hear them. So you bring the public in, you bring communities in, you ask them to inform, to collaborate and perhaps help you to disseminate the results. You might even empower them to do that. You might have them right at the start of the process to help design the process and then the participation tails off, perhaps because it's very technical or there's ethical issues. So participatory research, as we're using it, is very broad. The services we want to help with do encompass this full circle because the challenges are the same. It doesn't matter if you're in vet medicine or if you're over in history. If you're doing participatory research, the challenges will probably have a great deal of overlap. So there's room for the services to support. You don't need to be doing participatory research as a, a full thing, you know, as you put in your funding document, you might have elements and at that point you might need some help. Or you might want to talk to people, other researchers who are doing this. What you need to do is just recognise that that's what's going on. So the umbrella of participatory research, I'm weirdly proud of this lovely little diagram. It took five minutes, but I just, I just like it. I think it's a very good umbrella with limited resources. It encompasses a whole range of different terms that you might come across. So PPI, uh, popular research is a lovely one, crowdsourcing, citizen science, co-produced research, participatory action research. Some of these are described as methodologies. Some of these are described as approaches to research. Some of them are described as research paradigms, but they all fit into this wheel in one way or another. They all involve getting people who aren't researchers to collaborate and help develop research practices in a small level or a high level. Now, one of the funny things that I have found speaking to a lot of people across the university is that it's not just the participatory side that's a little bit of vagueness coming about, but it's also the research side, like what constitutes research? And this is also just worth flagging to think about. Um, when you're getting the public involved, often your research methods, if you're doing a high level collaboration, are going to be very, very different from what you'd do if you were just setting up yourself and having the participants as objects of, or subjects of study, sorry, um, beyond the barrier. If they're getting involved, you might suddenly change the research paradigms, the methods you use, but you might also change your outputs. So it's important to think about how your research outputs might change. Perhaps you're going to do an arts based research output alongside a published paper. So keeping in mind that participatory research is both broad in the sense of the methods you employ, but also 
the direction you might take. So I didn't choose any external examples to flag this because I know there's people in this meeting who've done some really amazing, exceptional work in this area. So I just wanted to flag a few from outside the university. Mapping for changes in UCL. That's actually when I gave you that example of people in an area who were like, oh, there's traffic noise. That's what they do. They help people to map um, issues of human geography, essentially, and they do very high, high, highly co-produced research. Uh, Living with Machines is a wonderful Zooniverse project. Um, it's a history project, I believe. Um, and it's more transcription based, very low level participation. So two extremes there, but both could be described as citizen science and are in fact done so. The Genetics of Taste Lab is fantastic. It's in a museum in the US. Um, they I think I've reached the end, but what they do is they get people in and they um, are looking at literally the genetics of taste and people are uh, the um, museum goers are involved at every stage of the process from helping to establish the question to disseminating the results to collecting the data and they actually upskill people as part of this process. So it's a perfect intersection of um, STEM engagement with um, STEM output. Wonderful, it's beautiful. Um, and then we've got the last one. This is, um, I think, PPI. Um, I'm just blanking for a moment for some reason. And so this is something that you would probably find over in CMVM. Our services then. So what we're looking at, we have very early stages. Like this, this, the idea for the service has only been running for a couple of months. I've been talking to a lot of you wonderful people, getting feedback, hearing from you, learning about what you might need and trying to suggest what we might offer. There's two kind of strands that we're looking at. So we're looking at the services we already have and making sure that they're suitable for participatory research. So we've got things like we've got all of our collections. So we've got the heritage collections. We've got the LHSA, so the Lothian Health Services Archive. All of these things have a huge potential for both subjects of study, which might be of interest, especially if you're in the humanities, but also if you're not, but also um, apps as crutches for engagement to help you support, to help you get people interested and involved. There may be really interesting and novel ways to support your community engagement side of your participatory research there. We've got things like the digital research services, scholarly, scholarly communications. These services exist, they're there, they're already really well set up to support participatory research and these areas um, are potentially problematic for researchers doing participatory research, things like data management plans, um, making sure that you assign credit to your uh, co-producers, making sure you reward your co-producers for their efforts. These kind of come under the banner of these services, retaining grey literature that you produce as part of your participatory research. That's a big issue and that's one I think the scholarly comms team can definitely help you with. And then physical spaces and events management. We have the library, we have the museum. We can try and figure out how to support you in these areas. Um, making them accessible and usable for you, especially if you're on the outskirts, is something we definitely want to talk about. Also looking at developing new services, some of them based in the library, some of them in relation to people outside the library. So there we've got um, networking is a big one. There is a meeting coming up. I'll talk about it later. Um, I'm working with a few people who are very keen to set up a participatory research network to get everyone from across the university who's undertaken this kind of research to be able to get together on a regular basis to share resources, to share training materials, and basically make it easier to coordinate this. Because I know some people who are isolated and alone working in a very distanced building are often lacking knowledge and access of these materials. And this will be a great way to do that. So we can talk about that as well later. Um, but like I said, there will be a meeting coming up. I'll tell you at the end. Um, also connecting ethically with participants and communities. If you're doing high level co-produced research, that's really difficult to make sure you're doing it in a safe and secure way. And I know for a lot of researchers, this can be quite intimidating. Figuring out how we can support this and how we can work with the people who are already doing communication, uh, community engagement at the university, and also the people who are researchers who have these connections and doing it in a safe way and an appropriate way is something we want to help. We know that we can't lead that. We also want to make sure we can support that. So setting up services, if they're applicable to that, there's a few ideas we might have as to how we can support that, but I'd love to hear your ideas on that. 
So here's some questions just I think we can end with mulling over and maybe prompt discussion, but feel free to go off and discuss anything you think is interesting. So when is participatory research an appropriate approach to take and when is it not? Not just in terms of methods, not in terms of what you as the researcher need, but also in terms of the community. What do you need to think about to make sure that what you're doing is beneficial to that community and is appropriate at that time? Because especially if you're doing highly co-produced research, it might be sensitive. So what have you found in your research where you've thought, yeah, this might help them and help me It's a win win? And maybe sharing that because I think people in other areas and people who might be wanting to get involved in this might be a bit scared because they don't know when they can do this. Um, what are the responsibilities of researchers to their participants, collaborators and communities? So you as a researcher, like where do you think the line is drawn? You have your own job, you have your own objectives. Um, for you, where is it? where does it end and where does the community's need start? What can you do to make sure that your needs are met? Because that is also important and like I think this has discussed it and I think the last session of this was very focused on this as your well-being matters too. So what are your responsibilities and how does that balance? How can we ensure that, especially in cases of high participation, external partners actually gain something from your involvement? So this is related to the first one. Um, awarding credit, um, publishing papers with their names as authors, for example. What are the things you think and you've found have been really good ways of doing that? What support would you need? So this is me being selfish. What would you need to adopt participatory research in methods in an ethical and methodologically robust manner? What services can we help with, basically? Um, and in what ways does participatory research demand an open research culture? Are there any tensions? I'll give you one example. If you believe um, so, open research often demands the um, data is shared for everyone. So you can reproduce it. I mean, it's in the name. Um, and you can um, make sure that everyone can see what's going on and then they can use their data later on. But if you're doing co-production with a community, who owns the data? If they own the data, they might not be willing to share it. So there sounds like there might be a little bit of a tension there. So it's a really interesting question to think about and figure out where those tensions lie and where the priority and responsibility lies. So yeah, so I'll just say thank you very much. I'm going to flag the Open Research Conference that's coming up in May. That's the 15th to the 17th of May. I'm going to be especially selfish and say on the 17th of May, there will be a workshop on participatory research. We'll be looking at community engagement within um, participatory research. We have a group of speakers coming in to talk about it. Um, and, that, and then we'll have a lovely chat, as we've discussed already. Chat is great for participatory research, perhaps with community members as well, if they're willing to attend. Um, after that, there'll be a short one hour, very informal in-person meeting to discuss setting up a participatory research network. You're more than welcome to just come to that. Just drop me an email um, and we can have a little chat about that. But yeah, so thank you so much for listening. I hope I didn't go on for too long. Um, and um, yeah, let's get started. Let me kind of let's get the conversation going.